Right, let's go to, speaking of heathens, let's go to Daniel Tyler McTeague, who is not a heathen either, um, who's doing fantastic work in uh, Barrow, has been doing for some time, and it's taken on a new wave of energy uh, as we go forward. So Daniel, I'll just get your presentation up and I shall move the slides on when you say next slide, please. So over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. And hi, everybody. Um, I've been a semi-regular attendee of these calls, so um, a lot of us know each other. Um, and I, I think I last presented about eight or nine months ago, um, when, as Tom said, we were Barra Culture. Uh, we were still in our first year um, as the Creative People and Places uh, programme in Barrow. Uh, since then, we finished our first year We've changed our name uh, due to popular demand and are, have been renamed with a name chosen by our communities, which is, as, you, as most of you know, is what Creative People and Places is, is all about. So we are now Barrowful uh, going forward and uh, for at least the next three years. Um, but again, as we talked about last year, it's, it's a sort of extendable program with Arts Council that, that should last um, at least 10 years. Uh, just there at the bottom, you can see some of the work by artist Kim Hubble, who did a Colours of Barrow project, which um, toured around the 13 wards of Barrow, uh, interviewing community members about their favourite colours or favourite buildings, and then taking colour samples from those places, building sites, um, and kind of the beaches and the coast and everything, um, and then formed an exhibition uh, earlier in the year. So next slide, please. So just looking back, because, you know, we've just all reported to Arts Council, so why not share our big numbers that we basically smashed through what we'd expected to do, which is uh, so we can brag slightly and then we'll move on. So this was our year one, um, over 21,000 engagements with people locally, uh, 237 events, 62 creative projects that came from the community. So we support those ideas at a very grassroots level that come from the people locally and we give our time and a little bit of money uh, towards it um, and we worked with 146 artists or creatives or at least that's how many we got to before we gave up counting um, and then at the bottom there we've got a, a kind of a more visual representation of some of the things that happened in our year one um, but we won't look back too much I'm here really to tell you about our plans going forward um, and things that hopefully uh, people and creatives from all over Cumbria can get involved with. So next slide, please. So uh, new for uh, year two, you'll all recognize at least a couple of these people um, from this call right now. So we have uh, three in-house artists, Tori Davis, who does a lot of our visual stuff. Um, that, that infographic you saw on the last slide um, was her work, as was our logo as Barrowful. Josh and Josh, JD and Swerve, JD's here today. Um, our in-house artists with us for this year and Danielle who all of us know um, is our artist for change um, working with me to look at how we really make as much of our work as inclusive and accessible as possible uh, with specific targeted programs and, and work um, with different communities with different needs um, to launch our new name uh, and kind of outlook JD and Swerve produced a track for us, which Tom's going to share with us. Look, let me speak truthfully. By the wind furnace, it's our home and our community. Full of life and opportunity. So we celebrate everyday creativity. It's where the sun meets the sea. Round here's a certain buzz about the streets, a whole hive of excitement, wonderful and vibrant. Round here we're spreading love and then peace. For just one location, it hosts a whole world of creation. It's a home for all kinds of inspiration. Trust me, we've got something for every generation. Film to theater, painting to literature. We share a common ground, all the people that were living here. It's a colorful, wonderful place that made us powerful. Forever we be powerful. And I hope you'll agree, we were so pleased with what uh, JD and Swerve created for us. Um, I'm not going to make his head grow too big while he's on the call with us, but um, no, we really love that uh, as a way to sort of make our, make our mark uh, and, and the new stamp of Barrowful 
on our place. Um, so these in-house artists and artists for change work with us in different ways as creatives, but also as um, that they might deliver workshops for us, help us with our branding as, as, as we've discussed, um, but also be kind of integral to some of that uh, planning going forward. Um, and obviously all live locally, so are all um, members of our area, of our place as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm just going to run through some of the things we've got going on right now and then sort of longer into the future. So today, uh, Nora's of Barrow is launched, which is a project that celebrates local women. Um, six, 16 life-size collages of local women are, have been pasted around the town, uh, which you'll all be able to see on our social media um, going forward, or if you're local, please wander around, have a look. Um, the, there's an exhibition to go with it at the Forum, which opens at four o'clock today, and then there are walking tours today and tomorrow um, with the artists to describe the process and to look at the artwork. Um, as well as a free collage workshop, 10 till 12 at the forum tomorrow. If you know anybody wants to go, they just have to turn up, they don't have to book. Um, so this has been one of our engaging Barrow artist residences, which has gone fantastically well. Two Spanish artists, Belen and Christina, met with, uh, they met 150 local women. They then interviewed 33 women from all walks of life, all different ages and backgrounds. And then 16 have been turned into the life-size uh, collages on walls and the other 17 have been part, a part of the exhibition and their words have been produced um, to be displayed as part of the exhibition. So that's our, our Nora's, which hopefully you'll see a lot of uh, online over the next week or so. Next slide, please. Um, coming up on Saturday the 28th of May, we're uh, having a kind of sharing day where we're celebrating the different community groups who we've supported with their ideas. So anybody who's got really keen memory, last time I presented, we talked about the Boosting Barrow's Creativity Strand, which is that one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you submit an idea, you live locally, you submit an idea, we help you out with project management time, with free space, uh, we give a little bit of money towards the project. And there have been, we're now on round three, but there have been sort of six, uh, so how many now? So there's just under 90 uh, have, have either happened or are running. So on Saturday 28th, we invited lots of these different projects to come and show off what they've been doing um, in Barrow Park. So again, if anybody's nearby on that day, please come along 11 till three um, with lots of, lots of stuff happening. Lots of you might've seen about the what the flock pom-pom sheep that have been, pom-poms have been coming in from all over the county and world um, to one of the, one of the projects that are making huge sheep made out of all of these pom-poms. The wool's returning to the sheep. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is one of our other um, residencies with Corey Campbell, who is creative director of the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. Um, he's doing a project called Men for All Seasons. He's working with a group of young men locally one week per season of the next year. Uh, so it's a sort of long-term project, but with, the, with, with sort of a one-week meeting point throughout um, on a creative project that, that basically explores them telling their own stories in, in ways that they want to tell them. So Corey is a theatre maker, filmmaker, uh, one-time rapper uh, and writer. So it's not, it's not necessarily any specific art form yet. We're meeting the young men and seeing, seeing what, what sticks with them in terms of them telling their stories. Next slide, please. And so this is, a, they're all really exciting, but this is a super exciting project um, that has got British Council funding through an international collaboration grant, um, which is an artistic collaboration with artists in Calcutta in India, um, which um, our in-house artists and artists trained, so Danielle and JD, who are here now, are involved with. Um, Initially, it was, a, it was a hybrid project. So initially there are online connections and we're having lots of Zooms at the moment. They'll run for a year. In July, the Indian artists are coming to Barrow for 10 days to uh, meet lots of local people, run workshops, perform and collaborate with our artists here. Uh, and then there's an exchange return visit in February next year as well. Um, so why Calcutta and why a new Duke route? Um, 
way back, uh, Jute from Calcutta and West Bengal came to Barrow, to the Barrow and Calcutta Jute and Flax Company. Um, there was a huge factory locally with 20,000 women, no, 20,000, 2,000 women, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, 2,000 women working, making all sorts of things, sandbags, fake hair, soles for shoes, <laughs> all sorts of stuff with Jute. Um, and we wanted to show you, we, get, we, we might skip through it a bit because it's silent and a bit lengthy, but we've got footage from 1902 of Barovian workers coming out of the duped factory. Uh, this is on the BFI website for anybody who wants to delve into it. I usually skip this first kind of 20 or 30 seconds because it's just the rich guys and we don't really care about them. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to skip a bit, um, the best bit is when we get to our good working class Barovians coming out. And lots of them fascinated by this camera thing in front of them. So can you locate where this is, Daniel? In um... Yes, so it's on the BFI website and I can send the link for it as well. I'll put it in the chat. And so as it goes on, you see more and more of the women who work there. Um, and then, Tom, if you can skip towards the end of the film. Towards the way through. For anyone who knows Barrow, this is where the, the Hind Pool uh, kind of retail park um, site is now. So it doesn't, doesn't exist as a building anymore. So in a mo. Um, and I'll keep talking anyway, but I will let it keep playing. But uh, there's, there's, there's a, a, a sort of horse and cart, which are visual artists from both places. Um, there's another one that comes down the road in a minute that has painting all over it. And is there's there's quite a link to the, the trucks that deliver water and things in on the streets of Calcutta. And so I know our visual artists are being briefed, here we go, um, to look at that, those two forms of transport and how we might um, look at um, something visual around those two ideas. Uh, so we really like that little bit of footage just because it's well, from 120 years ago and really, you know, a snapshot of, of that. Um, so that's the new Duke route. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And also uh, that the 1st to the 10th of July, we really do want as many people as possible to meet our Indian artists. So we'll be, we'll be arranging some kind of open for uh, events where, where anybody's welcome to come along, um, not just Barovians. Um, so another thing from this from the global to the hyper local, um, we have just adopted these two red telephone boxes outside of Barrow Library. Um, we've had to go ahead with planning permission and we have signed contracts with BT. And as soon as BT take the phone gubbins out, we are turning these into mini exhibition, mini performance spaces, um, which have kind of two um, a remit of two things. One is to showcase and celebrate artwork by our local people here. But as the title suggests, Barrow Calling, but other places calling Barrow, we really want to reach out across Cumbria and potentially even further to um, host works in these um, telephone boxes as an ongoing thing year round, um, always having something in there. Uh, they might be mini events or they might be things you just look at from outside. Um, but we're quite excited about that um, as a place-based programme. They are very, very securely rooted to our place <laughs> and won't go anywhere. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is something that I just wanted to put in people's diaries and heads from now, um, because it's the kind of thing that we want lots of people to be involved with and not just young people. Um, but in July next year, we're going to be hosting the third iteration of Four With By Festival of European Youth Theatre. Um, the first two uh, were in 2018 and 2021 after a delay from COVID in Birmingham. Um, and this involves around 10 English youth theatres um, and five youth theatres from different European countries coming together to perform, um, do, uh, run masterclasses and workshops to uh, collaborate in a place. This time the focus is really, really on how do we get as much public engagement and wider engagement of all ages with 
excellent youth theatre as performance, but also those behind the scenes things, with workshops and, and learning and skills development. So we're connected in already with Forge Festival uh, locally, um, who we'd love to come and showcase their stuff here. Uh, but I really want to just flag this to the whole call, really, so that everybody knows it's happening. It's definitely happening. Um, and any thoughts, ideas um, or connections that people want to feed into that, we'd love to hear from you. So that's Forward by, which is also exciting. And I think that might take us to questions and also all of our links and things if you want to find out more. Thank you very much, Daniel. What a great presentation. I've just got that. I've got that tune just going through my head now. Uh, J, the J, JD and Swerve tune, and also I just, I just love archive film like that. You just, I love the way the little kids go, "Oh, there's a camera," and they wave at them. And also, it's not just little kids; it's adults as well who are going, "Oh, what's that over there?" And to see, just see the waistcoats and the caps that the blokes were wearing. This is about 1903, 1904, I think it was on that. Is that right? Uh, Nineteen eighty-two, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, I just find that that whole period of history absolutely fascinating and just isn't it lovely that you can actually still see moving images of, of what that was like. Well, I'm really excited by Barrafall. I think it's I think it's an amazing project that you're leaving there, Daniel. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, please put your hand up or raise it electronically or visually. But Daniel, can I ask you, um, so Barra Culture started, what, 18 months ago? Is, it about, is that about right? Yes, yeah, the, so the funding was about 18 months ago, but in terms of the programme officially starting, it's been a year, basically. Okay. So, so what, you know, what, what have been your proudest moments that you've achieved so far in that time, do you think? And I suppose my, my supplementary in a sort of press conference at Downing Street, they ask about four questions at the same time way, is um, how do you think the people of Barrow have benefited from this project. So, so proudest moments and how have people of Barrow benefited? Um, for proudest moments, I'm going to start with something I usually end with because I don't want to forget it. My favourite piece of feedback from the last year was from a nine-year-old boy who said, it was nearly the best day of my life, <laughs> um, which, <laughs> which is brilliant. I'm, I'm really happy with that. We're happy to be nearly the best day of the nine-year-olds. And that was just when he met you, that was the moment, was it? Or was it, what was he actually <laughs> talking about? He, I think he was talking about um, our Furnace Yule events, which was our kind of Viking-inspired winter festival um, with flying Norse goddess seven metres up in the air, fire and Viking ships and potter, Nor Norse pottery and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so obviously we've got those big landmark events that we're proud of in that they really got out to lots and lots of people um, and there are we've got a youtube channel so you can see kind of short videos that sum up those so, so they're always really easy to be proud of but i think it is the personal interactions there's a group a, a sort of a very much community-led group uh, in ormsgill one of our areas of the town um, and it's for women uh, who are all moms of, of young families who are just striving to do to make their place better and their area better for everybody and a big chunk of that has been working with us on the kind of arts and culture and creative provision locally um and it's gone from them saying oh we don't know we don't know just give us stuff uh, to you know they've been sat on a zoom with me where i've been completely muted and they have interviewed professional artists from across the country for them to then engage in the program that they're commissioning them to do so and and i think that's i drive away from those kind of meetings or zoom or move from the click away from those zooms and feel proudest in terms of delivering on creative people and places creative people and places um just because that feels like it's it's happening there you know um and just from my own background growing up it's that you know that's what places like that need and people need that that sort of helping hand and guidance um I kind of, I've, I've got into the habit of saying there are 55,000 artistic directors here um, and I'm just the kind of funnel <laughs> or conduit or something that sort of connects them with the people they want to program. Um, so yeah, we've had really fantastic um, feedback and sort of stories of um, people disclosing really personal stuff in terms of how, how engagement with us has helped their own well-being um or sort of their own yeah their own challenges with with mental health so that's the proud the proud bits and then what was the other bit uh that was it i think really oh fab. How, there we go. How, well, <laughs> how people in barrow benefited from the project and i think you've outlined some things there 
Yeah, I think so. Hopefully, I've done that. And we could also look at we could look at JD and Daniel. I was going to say JD if, if, they... you're, if you're there. <laughs> you know, as a as a man of Barrow, how has Barrow full previous Barrow culture? How's that impacted on Barrow? Do you think? Uh, personally. Uh, having all these different things to have on, I know growing up through like my adolescence, there was like, it felt like there was an absence of things to do. Um, probably ask any teenager or young person in the town, they'll say the exact same thing. But seeing all these things occur, like, i.e. the Yule, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make that. But seeing all the pictures, I, I, I've never had like FOMO about things happening in Barrow. But I was like, oh, I've missed out. And it's made me want to attend more. Like, I don't know. It's it's just great to see generationally as well all the different ages of people that are attracted to the events that Barrowful have put on. It's like nothing's been ever seen before in this town. I'll tell you that. Well, Danielle, you also you lovely lovely picture of you on one of the slides there as well. Danielle, what's it what's it been like for you? Um I've I've, I've I've enjoyed it. I've I've loved um, the feedback. Seeing um, some of the workshoppers from last summer, and then they repeat and come back, and seeing them grow with the confidence of the creativity and the communication skills, and and like how they were shy and they're getting a bit more confident. And um, there's a there was a a, a member um, that came they'd never stitched before. And then, and then they've been. Um, they did the playcation in the park, and then they came to every single event. Um, and then, and then now they're making stuff at home. I gave them a little homework. So every time, it's just been absolutely amazing. Um, all the different people that we've been working with, different ages, different abilities, um, and it's really, yeah, it's really, it's amazing. It's and especially the homeschool group as well. Um, yeah, special. Excellent. Well, Amy's just saying there, I really admire all the creativity that goes on in Barrow. Despite living in Carlisle, I got my creative start in Barrow with Signal Film and Media. I'd love to see these kinds of projects throughout Cumbria and in Carlisle too. And I'll, I'll come back to you, Daniel, with a question in a second about how, how can it be of broader interest to people beyond Barrow? Um, Emma Parsons, who knows a bit about evaluation, says, what a great quote. I, I'm assuming that's the nine-year-old chap, Emma, that you're talking about, about almost the best day of my life. Get it on the front of your evaluation report. I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, and uh, and Claire just asking about the footage as well. Um, have you got an answer to your question, Claire, about um, BFI, or do you want Daniel to drop your line about that? Just Claire was just asking you, Daniel. Yeah. To, yeah. Yes, there's been um, two or three people have direct messaged me with contacts. So that's fantastic. It's really helpful. Right. Okay. Right. So Daniel, just to wrap up, then um, you know of interest to the hinterland of Cumbria? How, you know, do you want people from beyond Barrow to get involved in this? We absolutely do. Obviously, as a place-based programme, we are primarily tasked with increasing the offer and engagement of Barovians, but that comes part and parcel with actually inviting more people into the place to, to both work creatively, but also to enjoy what's going on. So um, any of our events are obviously completely open and inclusive in terms of our public events. Um, and then I think those larger kind of collaboration projects like, that's why I've been uh, sort of highlighted the, the, the Youth Theatre Festival, that, that is deliberately about bringing more people here um, to then engage with Barovians. So um, yeah, the, the sort of the message to everyone around the county really is to just get in touch if you think there's a way in which we can um, collaborate or invite each other, even if it's just coming along to each other's um events exhibitions yeah yeah just support is always good isn't it well daniel may it continue to go from strength to strength Joe, Great, to um, sorry yeah. can i just so i forgot how to put my hand up electronically sorry <laughs> can i just ask a question um uh, i think it's, i just want to get political for a minute if that's okay um we've just had some really critical uh local elections and uh for some of us i think the results of those elections for Westmoreland and Furness underline uh, some quite, you know, stark differences between Barrow and the rest of the local authority that we find ourselves in, um, some of us rather reluctantly. Um, so I think there's something to be said for Barrowful taking on the challenge of helping to educate um, some parts of Westmoreland and Furness 
in um, you know that important cultural and um, class difference in our town. Um, one you know politics is one indicator of the differences, um, but there are also geographic, um, geological, as mentioned earlier, and uh, and lots of other differences as well. So um, kind of arts and culture as a means of bridging communities, um, helping to educate about the challenges of certain places and the opportunities um, of others. So I'd, I'd just like to see that point made at this particular point in time, in this particular month, you know, when we've no, had political process. Thank you, Joe. And um, absolutely, once the dust has settled after the elections, which obviously took place uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I thought we could do a Friday call actually just dedicated to you know, with the with the with the reshaping of the county, um, uh, let's think about how arts and culture, and um, lobbying is too strong a word, but how do we get arts and culture really as high up the agenda as we possibly can with our recently elected politicians in due course? So, yeah. so we might. I, I feel very strongly. About it. You can probably hear. I feel very strongly about it. I, I think there is a need for some uh, local leveling up. You know, it's all very well the government and the arts council leveling up. Um, I think we need to demand it in our local authority. Thank you, Joe. Good point, well made. Thank you very much indeed. All right, um, it's just gone 10 o'clock, so we are gonna move on, but just to finish there, Daniel, thank you so much for that presentation. Virginia, do you wanna come, just wanna come back on that? Uh, yes. A couple of things to, just to squeeze in, but off you go, Virginia. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, Joe, and I've just put in the, um, in the chat, so I, I've, I've taken arts and culture into my sustainability, sustainable communities and localities portfolio on the shadow, shadow cabinet. Um, uh, but not the shadow cabinet, the cabinet of the shadow. And um, I mean, the, 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 the remit is completely unclear. Do you know, we are shadow, we, we are really creating a world in the, in the image that we want. And, um, um, and let's, let's do that um, with um, arts and culture throughout the, uh, throughout the, throughout the authority, because, um, you know, um, obviously you couldn't have different, you know, more different needs from Barrow than um, sort of, you know, um, North Pennines. Um, and um, I just heard, um, um, sorry, was it Dan, um, just to mention that there were 55,000 people in Barrow, or the 55,000 people in Eden. So, you know, there's hugely different uh, needs and hugely different opportunities and, um, and um, let's go for it. Thank you, Virginia. We shall return to this subject. Right, Daniel, thank you. Thank you uh, for your presentation and lovely slides. And we wish you continuing success with the, with the events coming up in the next uh, weeks, months and years to come as well. Right, let's go from Barrow to just outside Penrith to Reged, where Claire Logan Stevens is uh, in charge of putting on stuff there, organizing stuff there, choosing what they do um, and curating various exhibitions. And there's a fantastic exhibition just about to open um, which she is going to tell us all about. So Claire, if you'd like to introduce yourself and I shall get your slides up for you. Okay, um, well, I'm Claire Logan Stevens. I'm Cumbrian born and bred, live in Staveley um, and have worked for the Dunning family who own Regged for on and off for about 22 years. In and just come a bit closer to your microphone if you can, Claire. Sorry? Just come a bit closer to your microphone if you okay. can. Do you want me to take my headphones off? I think that might help. Is that yes, better? Yes, yes. Carry on. Okay, doc. Um, so, where COVID gave us a chance to really sort of stand back from Reghead because we were shut for quite a long time. Um, and we sort of reflected on what Reghead was. We, we've invested quite a lot of money uh, in it during COVID. And we thought, well, Reghead is, you know, it's, it's, it's so many different things to different people. It's, you know, it's a place to catch up with friends, buy some lunch, discover an artist, brainstorm with a colleague, escape to the movies, spend precious time with your children, potter around the shops, learn a craft, watch a ballet, plug in your laptop, eat local food, celebrate a rainy day. Um, it's a place that we aim to celebrate what's great about Cumbria, its landscape, its food, its culture and its people. Uh, and we thought a little bit more about what we needed 
the gallery to do. And so we came up with some guiding principles for programming the gallery uh, that we wanted every exhibition to really be able to fulfill these three things. And by place, we mean, does it have a natural connection with Cumbria? Quality for us means forward thinking, high profile. Will it build our gallery's integrity and wide appeal? Will it attract significant and diverse audiences? Because we're a family business, so it's, it's really difficult for us to access public funding. So when we're thinking about our exhibitions, we also need to make sure that they're going to be commercially viable uh, as well. Um, and so that's really a background to, to Matisse and the contemporary paper artists. We feel really it should tick all those boxes because Cumbria's got a 400 year heritage in paper making. Uh, we hope, as you'll see with what we've got there, that it will tick the box on quality and will have wide appeal. Next slide, please. So, so this exhibition came about because, first of all, um, I discovered that I could hire uh, a touring exhibition called Matisse Drawing with Scissors um, and that's uh, a touring exhibition from the Haywood Gallery uh, as part of the South Bank and the background to this exhibition is that it's uh, about the final four years of Matisse's life which is when he was sort of bedridden quite a lot of the time and he learned how to literally draw with scissors by cutting into uh, gouache uh, painted paper and creating these amazing paper cuts and this exhibition uh, is 35 he chose 35 of his cutouts uh, and transferred them into lithographic prints ready to be published in an issue of the Verve which was a French arts review and I don't think this exhibition's ever been uh, in Cumbria. It's, uh, when I came across the exhibition, I thought, well, 35 prints is not gonna fill very much of my gallery. Uh, and how could I sort of build on, build on this theme? And I think through, through the locking glass uh, brought me into contact with Amy Williams, um, who's an amazing paper artist from Kendall. So we spent a bit of time uh, talking about paper as an art form and all the different aspects of it. So the exhibition, which uh, opens on Saturday, you'll come first and foremost into this separate room with the Matisse 35 lithograph prints there. Um, the Haywood were very clear that they wanted a sort of, they were happy for other things to be combined in the exhibition, but they wanted a sort of separate room for Matisse. So you'll come into Matisse first and then you'll come out uh, into the uh, bigger gallery and so the first thing I wanted to do was to try and explain to our public why we were doing a paper exhibition and, and the heritage that we have here in Cumbria. So we've created this beautiful timeline uh, telling 400 years of paper making history in Cumbria, which then leads on to a bit of a, a showcase on James Cropper who are doing amazing uh, things with paper. So not only do they produce all the, the paper for the poppies for Remembrance Day, which they've been doing for 40 years, but they were also the first people in the world to come up with a solution to recycling coffee cups and giving them a se second life as speciality paper. And they've created collar form, which is a non-plastic packaging. Uh, so we've got a little bit of a sort of profile on them. Next slide, please. So uh, I then wanted to use the rest of the gallery uh, to showcase all the possibilities of paper as an art form. And uh, so I started my research in Cumbria. Uh, and discovered uh, people, I knew Tracy Eskam uh, because she'd been in through the locking glass and I uh, knew Mark Gibbs and Elizabeth Shorrock. Um, but I also discovered Emma Boyce, who was right on my doorstep in Penrith, who's an amazing uh, paper cut artist. Uh, we would also have had Ellie Cheney in as well, but unfortunately she's she's had a bereavement, so she's not able to come into the exhibition. But we we discovered some brilliant paper artists on our doorstep. And then further research brought me into contact with this amazing lady in Hebden Bridge called Pippa. 
a real leap of faith on her part because I discovered her contact details, emailed her, uh, and she is an incredible paper artist. And she was very happy uh, to help me uh, and introduce me uh, to the Paper Artists Collective, which is an international group of paper artists, uh, a lot of whom exhibit all over the world. Um, and it's a by introduction group. And so she became my, um, my spokesperson in the group uh, and introduced me to a lot of paper artists that I would, was then able to invite to be part of the exhibition. So we have in total 41 paper artists taking part, uh, 200 artworks covering everything you can possibly imagine from paper cut, paper sculpture, animation, collage, quilling, weaving, origami, um, and uh, so that's going to take up most of the uh, wider exhibition space. So next slide, please. I thought I'd just um, show you some of the, the work, um, just to show you the different aspects. This is, this is Tracy Eskin. This is a new piece of work she's done of Rydal Caves. Uh, and she's just literally layering uh, white and black paper to create this amazing uh, artwork. Next slide, please. This is Naomi Kendall. She is fascinated with geometry. And this is an example of hand cut and woven paper uh, to create a very colorful art piece. Next slide, please. Uh, Nicola, um, she, a lot of the paper artists are, you know, they're all full-time professional uh, artists. A lot of them doing very commercial work, whether it's for big brands, for uh, window displays or for animation and film. So Nicola is, is someone that um, works commercially in animation and film, producing paper art for different projects. She's a mas master artisan of paper sculpture with the Michelangelo Foundation, and she was a theatre designer. And this is a 3D sculpture, check it. Uh, very, very clever. Uh, next slide, please. This is Helen. Um, kind of one of the leading paper artists in the country very she was an illustrator loves uh, layering paper inspired by 19th and 20th century decorative design uh, she does lots of commercial work but has enjoyed the opportunity with this exhibition invite to produce some work that she wants to produce as, as opposed to being commissioned and inspired by her walks in the countryside next slide please uh, and so Yulia, uh, she is her, uh, the artist championing quilling. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really see it on, on this piece of work, but um, it's lots of rolled up pieces of paper, uh, strips of paper to imitate uh, brush strokes. Um, next slide, please. And then someone a little bit more uh, totally different again. This is a photographer and he produces clever illusions with crafted paper cuts using uh, famous landmarks. He describes himself as a non-destructive vandal. Uh, he is an absolute Instagram sensation with uh, over half a million uh, followers. Um, on, on Instagram, so I'm very hopeful that he's going to share share lots of information about the exhibition as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so the final part of the exhibition was a commission. So we did a call out, uh, and we were asking artists to come up with an idea uh, that would connect with Cumbria, that would be very Instagrammable, and would also inspire people to have a go at paper craft right at the end of the exhibition. Um, Amy Williams successfully won the commission again for us because she came up with the most original idea. This is a terrible photo, I'm sorry, but um, she has created uh, nine um, headpieces, uh, five of which are wigs, um, so think Bridgerton, and uh, each of them connect with a different industry in Cumbria. So you can see a shipbuilding one uh, on the left. We've got pencil making on the right. She's done one about shoemaking, tourism, slate. And her brother is a fashion photographer in London. So he's come and photographed models wearing the wigs 
which is going to create a sort of historic wall painted in crimson with ornate frames and there'll be an empty frame so that you can then go and create your own hat and embellish it with your identity and, and join the wall of fame. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, also to say that a lot of the artists are going to be running workshops uh, in the summer as well, and for adults and for children. So the exhibition will be open every day until the 4th of September. I have had no funding for this exhibition, so I'll be charging a small admission fee, but I feel that it's probably an hour to an hour and a half experience. And if anyone would like to come to the private view on Friday at Reged, it starts at 6 p.m. and you'll be very welcome. And that's it. Claire, that's fantastic. What beautiful, beautiful images again. Um, and uh, what an exhibition to look forward to. And congratulations on pulling it all together from the Hayward and getting all those artists involved as well. And before we shower you with too much praise, we're going to hear yeah. from those artists, uh, which is Mark Gibbs, um, who was mentioned by Claire there um, as uh, one of the artists that she knew already. So, Mark, I'll get your slides up um, Thank you. for you. And if you'd like to introduce yourself while I do that, and then I shall start Brilliant. sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tom, for this opportunity. Thanks for everybody for coming along. And it's, it's been absolutely fascinating seeing that preview there. Thanks to Claire, I'm really you know, proud to be in this exhibition. I thought what I would do is just give you uh, a, like a little introduction to my work and then expand out into, the, into this paper show. Um, so here's my introductory slide. If you might not know my work, if you do, perhaps you have seen, um, I make horse sculptures, cavalry sculptures, out of thousands of strands of recycled wire. Um, and uh, that, that's been my main sort of practice for quite a while. But for a while, I've, I've been moving into paper. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, after setting the scene, I thought I would uh, show you those. So there's some statements about my work there, how I think about my work. I've got about seven slides here, and so I'll take you through them. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, this piece was shown at Reggae recently in a Lake Artists exhibition. Um, I make these cavalry figures, thousands of strands of recycled wire and other materials. I'm interested in obsolete powers. This is work about the First World War. But also it's contemporary relevance, because I maintain that some of these obsolete mindsets are very, very, still continue to wreak havoc today. And ideas that perhaps some aspects of economics can be seen as war by other means. Next slide, please. So thinking about peace, I've been thinking about the peace dove. And is it a cliche? I think in many ways it is, and I've been trying to reanimate it in some way. And this piece dove is made, it's called Wounded Dove, and it's made from the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights in various languages, shredded. If you look closely, you can see some of the uh, words still there. So the work in this exhibition, um, I, I, I don't, I've put forward six pieces, whether they're all going to get in, I don't know. So I'm going to show you some of them. This is one of them. So it's going to be a very exciting for me on preview night. I've been thinking about peace and whether this dove, whether the peace dove symbol is a cliche. And I'm wondering, but actually, in a, in a world where hospitals are routinely targeted in conflict, that really peace perhaps needs to be more battle hardened. And I've become fascinated by a group of birds called 
nightjar. These are migratory birds that come from, they migrate from Africa and a smaller population from the Middle East. And immediately when you think of their migration story, migration is a very hot topic at the moment. And they are amazingly well camouflaged, and I'll give you an example of that now. So have the next, next slide, please. So here we have a spot the bird competition. There is a nightjar, it's a, called a fiery neck nightjar, and they migrate from Africa to Spain. We don't generally get them in Britain. And it's looking straight at you. And you can, I'll give you a little um, chance to see it. And I've been um, in contact with a, a group called, at Exeter University called the Sensory Ecology Group. And um, they're very interested in the development of camouflage and how birds and other animals use camouflage. There's a, there's a study that shows that these birds pick the very best place to sort of nestle in the, rest, the, the right direction, which shows that they have an understanding of themselves. So it's a window into their own psychology. Uh, next slide, please. The big reveal. So these birds are amazingly well, uh, nightjar are amazingly well uh, camouflaged. They're nocturnal and they hide in plain sight relying on their uh, camouflage plumage during the day. And I've just become fascinated about how well, how effective this plumage is and could I recreate it in some way with a twist? Could I have the next slide please? So this piece is called War and Peace. And it's quite unusual for me because I'm moving up into the 20th century, talking about 20th century conflict. And it's one of perhaps one of the more raw pieces that I've made. The effectiveness of nightjar camouflage depends on the fractal nature of their plumage. There is a species of nightjar called Egyptian nightjar that live in um, obviously Egypt, Israel, Syria, and they are greyish. And if you look at this bird, which is actually quite realistic, I hope you can see its plumage is made feather by feather, but I've swapped the plumage for the Arabic word salam which means peace. So like, like many of you, I've been absolutely shocked by world events. And um, this piece was made during the um, Russian aerial bombardment of Aleppo. And the use, I've been absolutely shocked by the use of cluster bombs, uh, banned weapons. Uh, there's a number of reasons why they, this particular sort of weapon is banned generally, but uh, Russia uses it significantly and also in uh, Ukraine. And of course, you know, like so many people, we're absolutely shocked that the war has come closer to you, actually come into Europe. Uh, so for me, the detail, the message, the message is on different levels, both literally and metaphorically. Next slide, please. So as well as talking about um, uh, military conflict, I've been looking at other sorts of conflict and other sorts of power. So this is this night job, um, it's actually modeled on a, a, a European night job, which uh, they migrate from uh, Central Africa, including the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola to, to Britain, and they're, they're arriving round about now. And it's made from banknotes, um, banknotes of the 1960s uh, and 70s, um, thinking about uh, the Af uh, two sorts really, um, pre-liberation struggle and shortly after. So some of the banknotes have got, um, for example, Angola um, was a Portuguese colony and it has the uh, dictator of Portugal on them. I can't remember his name now. And then some of them have uh, when it's it's gone into uh, the very, very difficult post liberation uh, period. And you start to see stars appearing and stars are guiding lights in a dark sky. And sometimes they refer to 
the white star of America, sometimes the red star of the Soviet Union and sort of the black African star. So you have ideas of uh, superpower interference in, in Africa. So there's a huge amount I could say about this. I'm going to keep this, uh, this presentation short. Um, if you'd like to follow my, my uh, practice, there's some, some links there. One of the questions I've been asking myself a lot is what gives me the right to make work like this because I'm not Syrian, I'm not African. And I've thought a lot about that. Um, I think that if the work is strong enough, it has its own right in its own terms. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but, but perhaps that would be for, for another time. I'm absolutely delighted to be in this, this paper show. I, I've just seen from the previews, I'm in really amazing company. One of the lovely things is that um, I, I'm also in a show um, at the Royal Cambrian Academy, um, and it's got a tour to the Sawhain Gallery in Manchester. So it's, it's been wonderful to have this opportunity in Cumbria. And then uh, another series of paper sculptures um, is going in, in, on tour um, uh, elsewhere as well. So that's a little, just a tiny little snapshot. And if you Thank have you any Mark. questions, if you have time, we'd be delighted to try and answer them. We're almost out of time, but just looking at the messages in chat, Derek says, really inspired and inspiring work, Mark. And Phil says, exquisite Thank you. art with strong and thoughtful ideas and messages. Brilliant work, Mark. And Kathy also complimenting you. you on your on your work, Mark. It must be, you must have incredible patience to do those things and pull them together in such exquisite detail. Um, and the details really matter in this kind of stuff. So I think the answer is get along to the exhibition at Reged, which opens on Friday, uh, and look at Mark's work alongside everybody else's and appreciate its beauty um, in all its detail. So thank you so much, Mark, for your time this morning, for sharing that with us. And Claire, thank you very much indeed for your presentation to give the bigger picture of the exhibition. Really beautiful exhibition, and I shall be going along for sure um, to have a look at it and just, just stopping and appreciating it. And all that Matisse stuff as well, coming to, coming to, coming to Reggae. What a, what a coup that is for the county as well. So thank you very, thank much, you very much indeed. Thank you. Right, it's 10.30. Next week, by the way, we've got a bit of a poetry special. Kim Moore is going to talk about the Kendall Poetry Festival, which is just around the corner. And I thought I'd invite one or two other people to come along and just sort of set the scene for the poetry um, story in Cumbria at the moment, which I suspect is quite vibrant. But I, I wonder whether we actually all get together sometimes and talk about it. So if you're interested in poetry, do come along next Friday. But even if you're not interested in poetry and you like art and culture in Cumbria, it might still be worth popping your head in and uh, seeing what's going on. So that's the plan for next Friday. The Friday afterwards, by the way, is the Queen's Jubilee weekend. So we won't have a Friday call uh, the Friday after that. Um, but next Friday, a bit of a poetry special. Thank you very much to everybody. Thanks to Daniel and Claire and to Mark especially for their beautiful presentations this morning. The bar is high on the presentation front. And thank you to everybody for your time this morning. Have a lovely weekend and uh, catch you again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.